Okay. Thanks very much, Joseph. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thanks very much um, to everyone here for showing up and um, to yours for the introduction and the organizers for organizing this, which I think is, is great. Um, I asked the organizers if they want to have an overview talk. So they asked me to talk about dark matter and scattering. Uh, they said they didn't want necessarily an overview talk, so I'm not going to do that, uh, but I'm going to just show some recent results. So uh, just way of introduction. So you know, the, the reason to look at electron scattering or even absorption by electron. So the reason to look for electron recoils is that it allows you generically access to much smaller dark matter masses than standard WIMP searches. So I've taken your two plots from the Department of Energy in the US basic research needs report for dark matter. And on the left, you see a plot for dark matter electron scattering. This is the dark matter electron scattering cross section on the y axis and the dark matter mass on the x axis. There's some current bounds, which already go down to 500 kV. And we'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later today. And then there's a green region where we can access in the near term, you know, over the next few years, uh, down to 500 kV and much lower cross sections with new experiments. We can probe important milestones, uh, various models. So here's a freezing line, for example. There's other models that I'm not showing here. And then there's very nice ideas from various people to probe even lower one mass down to you know, kV, 10 kV masses. Um, uh, so that allows you to get to well below the GV scale, well below the weight of masses. Now on the right side, I'm showing bosonic dark matter absorption. So the idea is that a boson can be absorbed, bosonic dark matter can be absorbed by an electron. And uh, this allows you to probe down to EV masses in the near term. There's a rebounds down to EV masses. And in the far term, uh, we can go down to milli EV or 10 milli EV even. So there's ideas to do that. So the outcome for the talk is the following. So I'm gonna talk about two very different regimes, two very different regimes in terms of electron recoils. One of them is order KV recoil energies. And there's a lot of excitement um, in the community. I think about the Xenon 1 ton excess, at least looking at the number of citations that this paper already has from Xenon 1 ton. So there's a little bump, which I'll talk about. And what I'll talk about is based mostly on the paper that I did uh, in June this year. So with uh, amazing um, junior people, Itai Bloch, Andrea Caputo, Diego Ridigolo, and Muko Shulapurka, and as well as two you know, older people, myself and, and Toma. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about a very different energy regime or a few EV energy electron recoils, where uh, I'll tell you about Sensei's recent results that we had in April, uh, the status of Sensei and also its plans. So let's start with the uh, Xeno one ton um, uh, explanation, and I'll give you some model uh, ideas for what models can work. So just to set the stage for the xenon one excess, so here's the plot from their paper. The key features are, so this is actually quite a large exposure. It's 0.65 ton year, so it's a very nice uh, search. A uh, lot of data, really great experiment. Um, there's an interesting excess, which is more than three sigma, and energy is mainly located in the two and three kV energy bins. The signal is a bump, so you see that the first bin is low, and efficiency is falling here, but this is clearly um, the, the red line is the background model, and this data point at the bottom fits uh, well with the background model. So this signal is brief is a bump. So that's what you have to produce if you want to explain this with new physics uh, or any other physics. Um, and the finite energy resolution allows for the delta function allows even for a delta function signal to explain the excess because it's going to be smeared. And what we did in the paper actually we take the measured you know um, scintillation and ionization signals from xenon one time. We do our own Monte Carlo, we reconstruct the energies um, and you know, we, we um, sort of reproduce as much as we can the Xeno one ton analysis. But at low two to three kV energies, the resolution is about half, EV, half a kV. Okay. And that allows a signal like a delta function to be smeared into multiple bins. Now there's various possible explanations. The, maybe the first one is a statistical fluctuation. Okay, that's always possible. Weirder things have happened. Uh, perhaps the most likely explanation just from Occam's razor is that there's an underestimated background. I'm not really sure if it's a new background, but an underestimated one. And the collaboration themselves have talked about tritium. Um, and people have also raised the possibility of, of 37 argon, although I think the collaboration is, is less sure about that that's really a, a viable explanation. But, but um, uh, yeah, I'm not really going to talk about these possible backgrounds. But, you know, we're not in the business, people like myself are not in the business, or no one really is in the business of just finding backgrounds. We want to explain your physics, find your physics. And uh, any excess like this, which has been really studied extremely well by the collaboration, deserves a very careful analysis and a discussion of how one can explain it. So as of yesterday, there have been 84 papers. 
mostly focused, of course, on the new physics interpretation. And uh, I will just, based on this paper, we try to cover quite a large range of models. But um, I'll say, of course, that there's, as you just saw, there's many, many other papers out there. So I will not mention all the possible models. I want to just give sort of some salient features of things that, that could work or where you run into trouble. So we'll consider two different types, absorption. So the idea is that uh, dark matter, a bosonic dark matter comes in. It could be dark matter or produced from the sun. Um, uh, and it gets absorbed by the electron. So we have the possibility of a dark photon, an axion or an axion-like particle, and a scalar. So the boson could be the dark matter itself. In that case, since the dark matter is non-relativistic, the electron recoil energy is basically just given by the dark matter mass. The whole mass gets absorbed. Or the boson could be produced in the sun, in which case the energy could be of order the temperature of the sun, so order a few kV, which curiously enough is exactly where the excess also lies. Uh, the other possibility that we look at is scattering. So I'll mention a few things, some of which work, some of which that don't work. So just the standard dark matter electron scattering, I'll talk very briefly about this, and then also modifying the type of interaction that dark matter has with electrons to add some momentum dependence to try and fit the signal a bit better. And then also the thing that works reasonably well, it's actually exothermic dark matter downscattering, which I'll, I'll mention briefly. And I think uh, Yuri is gonna talk actually about another sort of general class of models and uh, which also happen to be able to explain the Zeno one time axis. So I think um, Yuri will talk about this a bit later. And there might be others, which, which, uh, which I'm forgetting. So let's start with absorption of a dark photon. So the idea is that you know, the dark matter consists of very light dark photons, in this case of order you know, two and a half keV. Um, on the left, you see that the signal, unsmeared signal, so it gets absorbed exactly at the mass, 2.5 keV, with a very, very small width, just given by you know, V squared and a minus six times the mass. And this is, uh, gets smeared to this Y Gaussian here, which um, then can fit the excess pretty well. So the gray is the background model, the bin signal is the sting in blue, and you see that you can provide a reasonable fit of about three and a half sigma. And if the question is always, there's always two questions, can you fit the excess without being, um, yeah, does it just give a good fit? And the second question, is it ruled out by anything else? Okay, and in this case, it's not. So in this case, actually this model works extremely well. Um, and yours of the company have done a lot of work on this in the past where, where they looked at dark photon dark matter absorption. And here is um, the one and two sigma regions in the kinetic mixing epsilon as a function of dark matter mass plane. So this is the best fit region, one and two sigma regions for xenon one ton. In blue are the <coughs> are stellar constraints from red giant and horizontal branch stars. And in green is another analysis xenon one ton did last year where they only looked for uh, ionization signals without an accompanying um, scintillation signal that's called S2 only. And that analysis was sensitive to lower recoils, so below a kV mostly, but they had some, they did go above a kV a little bit. Um, and that's why you see some, some uh, region constrained above the kV, but it had a lot less effective exposure than the analysis that Xenon one ton put out this, this year. So this is not really constraining either. And then just for fun, um, so I'm not an expert on this, if someone wants to know more about this, there's a reference at the bottom of my slide here, where uh, there is a anomalous, possibly anomalous cooling in, in horizontal branch stars, which, which curious enough goes through the Xenon one ton um, excess. So, you know, so this is a model that works. Um, so I think the, the nice thing is that this is not, you know, I mean, this is one example where one can say that this Xenon one ton excess from a new physics point of view is not, is not crazy at all. It, it definitely is interesting to look at. Now, other things don't work so well. So let's give you one example of things, something that doesn't work well. Um, here, I'm showing the same thing for scalar dark matter. So now instead of a dark photon, you have a scalar. And the Xenon one ton excess, again, can be fit very well, of course. Uh, it always shows up in this case, just as a nice bump. But now if you look at the constraints, the constraints are much, much stronger than the couplings that you need to explain the excess. And this just comes about because um, the absorption rate for scalar dark matter is much smaller. So there, there's strong constraints you have to consider. Um, instead of being the dark matter itself, the dark photon can also be produced in the sun, as I was mentioning. In this case, there's a spectrum that you have to fit. So in this case, the, the spectrum looks like this, the dashed line. And once you smear with a detector resolution, again, you get this nice fit, uh, in this case, 3.7 sigma. Um, but again, if you actually ask, does this 
work with the model parameters that you need in order to fix the excess? And the answer is that you're disfavored by, again, stellar cooling bounds. And this is also true generically for other bosons as well. So I'm not going to show them all, but it's also true for dark, for scalars and for, um, for axion-like particles. So to summarize the absorption part, so the dark photon, dark matter works well. The solar dark photon, it, that's, bound, that's constrained by stellar cooling. I also mentioned the scalar dark matter being disfavored by stellar cooling. And I'll just fill in the rest of the boxes without going into details. Um, and ALP can work. So you, the only thing is that you need to avoid, so the uh, axon-like particle can decay to gamma gamma, and you need to avoid any direct coupling to photons. Otherwise, in order to fit the axis, the couplings are so large that you would be just ruled out by X-ray uh, constraints. So two and a half kV X-ray constraints. So, so this can work with some model building, um, but the stellar constraint again naively doesn't work. Uh, uh, sorry, the solar produced ALP again naively doesn't work. Now there's additional model building that one can do, and we also tried this in the paper where one can try to avoid the stellar cooling constraints. Um, and, and there's several papers on this on this topic to try and avoid this. But this is a quick summary. So let's talk about next about dark matter electron scattering. So not absorption, but scattering. And I'll just talk about a few models. Uh, ask the question, can it provide a good fit to the axis? And then ask if it's actually viable, like uh, not all disfavor from other constraints. So standard dark matter electron scattering does not provide a good fit and is not viable. Explain this. And by standard, I mean the thing that we usually consider in the low threshold direction community, where you've got dark matter that interacts with some dark photon, for example, or a scalar, um, so some massive scalar or massive dark photon. Um, and the problem is, quite generically that here's the, the rate, so the y-axis, the absolute value of the y-axis is not important actually, but here's the, the rate as a function of the recoil energy of the electron. And you see that at lower thresholds, the rate is huge. And then as you get to the KV range and beyond, it drops by many, many, many orders of magnitude. And that just comes from the form factor suppression. So if you want to explain the, the bump here, um, maybe you can do it, but you are going to be disfavored by a lot, but also magnitude from Xenon one ton S2 only search or um, other experiments like Sensei that I'll talk about and, and or C CDMS uh, low threshold searches. So this doesn't really, uh, is not really viable. And also the, the fit is not really great either because um, it doesn't give you as bumpy a feature as you might like. Now you can try to modify this with some momentum dependence. So you can imagine that Darkman has some, you know, crazier coupling with electrons. So through some high dimensional operator, here's some ugly operator that I've written down that can produce a momentum dependence, uh, momentum dependent interaction. So here that momentum dependence in the form factor goes as Q squared and the cross section would go as Q to the four. So what happens is that at higher recoil energies, which require high momentum transfers, you will um, get a higher rate. And then you can make this um, plot look like this. And then maybe you can imagine that you can fit a bump here. Um, and maybe you can imagine that you're not going to be ruled out by low threshold experiments. But the problem here is that um, this, the couplings that you need, or in particular the scale of this operator that you need in order to explain the excess, is so small that you know, this operator needs to be generated at a very small scale so that collider searches would have found those particles that generate this, this operator. So this is also not a great explanation. The thing that works perhaps best is exothermic dark matter. And uh, I want to mention that in, in just a, in, in two minutes. So the idea is the following. So this is actually an old topic, but the idea is that dark matter consists um, of two states, both of which are in our halo at some level. Um, the two states have a small mass splitting. So you can imagine that you've got some Dirac fermion and then with some, inter in some interactions with the Higgs, with some dark Higgs, you would be able to split the Dirac fermion into two Majorana particles. So we call it a pseudo Dirac fermion. So here's the, um, this sort of diagram, some heavy state, some light state with some more small, small mass splitting. Um, and then you can imagine some, there's some off diagonal coupling through the dark photon that allows the dark photon, the dark matter to interact with the electrons, for example, in your uh, Xenon one time experiment. And the coupling is off diagonal, so typically chi one will couple to chi two through the dark photon. So there's no elastic coupling like chi one, chi one, or chi two, chi two with, with the dark photon. So you don't have any elastic scattering, so chi two can't scatter into itself, chi one can't scatter into itself, but you could have inelastic where chi two scatters up into chi one, or exothermic down scattering where chi one scatters into chi two. Um, now, when the heavy guy scatters into the lighter, dark matter state, there is no, um, there's no 
barrier in terms of the energy, right? So it's just free to do that. It just needs to interact because it's an exothermic interaction. And um, this was actually first discussed for dark matter electron scattering by Josef and company in a 2017 paper. They almost got the mass right, the, the splitting right, the delta, this delta and this delta. So in terms of fitting the xenon one ton access, so they were, were uh, very prescient in terms of thinking about this model. But you can see that the spectrum now looks quite broad and very bumpy. So here in orange is a one MeV dark matter particle with a splitting of one keV. And you see that it peaks near the keV bound. Um, and here is a very lighter, is a much lighter dark matter particle, 100 keV, again with a splitting of one keV. And the, there's also a nice bumpy feature. And now you just need to dial the splitting to get it and figure out what the couplings are in terms of fitting it to the no, ex no. excess. And um, here's what you find. So in terms of, so it depends on how much dark matter is in the heavy state, of course. Uh, but so in terms of that fraction times the cross section for dark matter scattering of the electrons and the function of the dark matter mass for splitting of 2.5 kV, there's a wide region in parameter space that can fit the zero one time excess. Um, so that, that model works very well and the fit is very good. So I'm not giving significance here, but it's a, it's a very good fit. Now the question of course is what is the abundance of this heavy state? And that is model dependent. And if you imagine that the dark matter, as I was saying here, that the two states coupled through dark photon, you can actually calculate what the freeze out abundance is of the heavy state and of the light state. And the interesting thing is that you find it actually fits really, really well. So you can actually have this coupling uh, so I have a pseudo direct coupled to a dark photon. Here now I'm showing the, the various plot in the sigma E versus M chi plane. I'm showing various um, constraint lines. So first of all, this black line is the line where you can get the right relic abundance for the light state. The heavy state is gonna be very subdominant uh, in this parameter space. The reason is that it actually can, as as the universe evolves, the heavy state is actually going to depopulate itself uh, and, and scatter into the light state. But there's some small fraction left over. That fraction is, you know, 10 to minus 5 here and 10 to minus 9 here along these two dashed lines or dotted lines. Um, and then in terms of though the heavy state, even though it's so subdominant, it can actually still explain the xeno one ton excess with the right rate. And in particular, this is the right region where you can have to lie in with, um, to explain the xeno one ton excess. So you can actually fit uh, the region pretty well in terms of getting the right relic abundance. Um, now, because you are, have light dark matter interacting with a light dark photon, there's various constraints from colliders, LSMD, E137, NA64, um, et cetera. There's also some CMB bounds. Uh, and uh, there's also an exothermic scattering and CREST-3 detector, which also has some constraints, but they're not just favoring this, this large region. And there's also spin, uh, sorry, there's also a self-interaction bound, which is this dotted line. So there's a large region which actually works very nicely. Um, so there's many people. Uh, so this this model has been investigated now by several collaborators, we, we, by several uh, groups. We're not the only ones, and there's other papers, and I probably missed some where people have looked at this in quite some detail. And I think um, you know people are still working out exactly you know, the, the the calculation of the dark and electron scatter rate is not completely trivial because it depends on the form factor and so on. So there's still some disagreement, I think, a little bit in the literature but um, this seems to work pretty well. Okay. So then in the, in the second part of the talk, in my remaining time, I wanna briefly tell you about uh, Sensei and uh, basically some recent results and, and also what our plans are. So we are a <clears throat> pretty small collaboration, about 20 people, four institutions. Uh, it's a fully funded experiment, um, funded by a private foundation in the US, Heising Science Foundation, and also getting a lot of the R&D support from Fermilab. And um, we've produced several results in subject dark matter searches over the last few years. So in, we started several years ago with a prototype skipper CCD, which was a very tiny um, CCD with 0.1 gram. In 2017, we've demonstrated a very low noise in terms of reading out the charge in these CCDs. Um, uh, and that allows us to give us a, give us a one electron threshold. In 2018, we had a surface run with that prototype detector and then followed by a 100 meter underground run in the Minos facility at Fermilab, where we looked at, um, where we also did some, uh, took some new data. And so this is all the last few years. And in this year, we now, over the past year, we've got, uh, we've received new skipper, we've procured new skipper CCDs. They're much more massive, about two gram. 
And um, one of those sensors, one of those super CCDs, we then placed 100 meters underground at Fermilab um, and took some data. And I want to briefly tell you about that data. So here's a picture actually of the CCD. Um, the gray stuff is not the CCD, that's something that covers the CCD, uh, but the CCD is a thing in the background that sticks out at the bottom and also on the top. Um, and just for some size reference, this is very approximate. I just did this with sort of roughly keynote, but this is a dime in, in the US. Uh, so this is the size telling how big the CCD is. Uh, what I just want to quickly tell you is what the data is that we got here and what the future plans are. So the idea, the detection idea is the following. So we have the CCD and the idea is that the dark matter comes in, hits an electron in the silicon in, in one of these pixels. So the CCD consists of you know, a few million pixels. The electron gets excited from the valence band to the conduction band, and then you can, the charge gets uh, collected in each of these pixels and then gets read out. Um, and when dark matter scatters of an electron, it typically creates one or a few electrons in a pixel. And in silicon, the band gap is 1.2 EV, so you need to give it at least 1.2 EV of energy. You need to give the electron at least 1.2 EV of energy to excite this electron. But, so this is already something I mentioned early on when I asked whether we could fit the xenon one ton excess with standard dark and electron scattering. And what you see is that the rate drops very, very fast as a function of the recoil energy of the electron or as a function of the number of electrons that you create. So depending on how much recoil energy you give that initial electron, you can create a different number of electron hole pairs. So typically you need 3.8 EV of energy to create an additional electron hole pair. Um, and this is the spectrum that you expect for a particular model through where you interact with a light mediator for 10 MV dark matter mass. And actually this particular cross section is where you can get the right radical abundance from freeze out, freeze in. So this is actually a real possible dark matter model where you can get the right radical abundance. And this is a spectrum that you could imagine seeing in your detector. Uh, but it's clear that the spectrum is peaked at very low number of electrons. So you need to be able to sense one, two, three, four electrons. Um, in 2017, the best detector was able to sense only two, before 2017, the best detector was only able to sense 10 electrons or more without noise. So you just miss this huge, huge um, uh, dark matter signal. So you need this um, single or few electron sensitivity to capture most of the dark matter events. Um, and so besides skipper CCDs, which I'll focus on in this talk, um, there's, of course, other experiments that can detect single electrons now, and we heard some of that yesterday in Jody's talk, for example. Uh, but SuperCDMS, Danae, and Edelweiss have all demonstrated um, the sensitivity to detect single electrons. So the new skipper CCDs, let me tell you a little bit more about those just in a minute or so. So they have 5.4 million pixels. Each pixel is 50 micrometer square big and 675 micrometer thick. So the thickness goes into the page here. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a very thin CCD. Uh, it's a very thin detector, but um, yeah, okay, so so good. And so the total size is about 1.6 centimeter and uh, across here, and about 10 centimeters across on the horizontal line, about two gram. They're designed by the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Microsystems Lab, and we have custom built low threshold acquisition electronics, so LT electronics. So electronics were specifically built for this. The CCD can be read out in, yeah. The CCD can be read out through four different corners. So the CCD can be split into quadrants and you can read out each quadrant separately. And in each of these quadrants, you shift the charge. So the charge, charge along the, on the CCD gets shifted to one of these corners. And in that corner, you collect the charge and the reader and the amplifier. And then by just measuring the charge multiple times, be able to reduce the noise of the measurement by a lot. So for the dark matter search, we measure the charge 300 times and reduce the electrons, read out noise from 2.5 to 2.14 electrons. So the detector set up at Fermilab, so as I already mentioned, it's about 100 meters underground in the Minos hall um, next to Nexus. So there's a little tent next to Nexus, which is where sensor is. Um, 100 meters underground to reduce muons. We actually put some extra lead shielding around here to reduce the background radiation and the CCD temperature is about 135 Kelvin. So the data, we took 22 images. So one image is 20 hour exposure and then 5.2 hour readouts. So it takes a long time to read out the whole CCD. Uh, we would have taken more images, but COVID-19 pandemic shut everything down in March. So um, here's an example image that shows half a quadrant. So you see lots of background, lots of events. All the white stuff are events. The straight lines are muons. These curly little things are electrons. The 
lobby things are x-rays and then there's lots of little sprinkles of one electron events that you see all over the place as well uh, many events so th so therefore many events are there from ambient ambient radioactivity and neons so um, the background radiation is quite high. So with the extra lead shielding, which is the thing shown in red, we have about a background rate of 3,000 DRU or 3,000 events per kilogram per day per kV in, in, the, in the low energy range here. So it's quite a large background still. So for the analysis, right, so we don't care about kV electron recall energies. We can't compete with xenon one ton. So we focus on the very low thresholds, very low recall number, very low number of electrons. So one, two, three, and four. And we do separate analyses for these. There's lots of regions you have to mask. So this is a very busy image, as I was saying. You have to mask regions that are clearly not dark matter, and we do different analyses for the different regions. Um, and then at the end, we find spectra where, let's just focus on the blue line. So here's the all pixels with zero electrons in them, all pixels with one electron, so you can clearly separate them. And then here's five events with, um, with two electrons in them. And there's no events with three or four electrons. So we see a lot of single electron events, a few two electron events, and no three or four. And the results, so we, um, the number of one electron events we observe is, seems quite large, and it is quite large. So it's 450 events per gram per day, but this is the lowest rate that's ever been measured in the silicon detector. And the interesting thing is that this one electron rate, what we find is that it correlates with the rate of high energy background events. So depending on, where, how much lead shielding you put around the detector, which changes how much background radiation you have. So either you put 3,000 events per kilogram per day per kV, or without the lead shielding, we find it to be 9,000. Um, the one electron of that we measure in terms of electron pixel per day is um, different, and it correlates with that background event. So we actually now have an understanding of the origin of these one electron events. Um, and we, so there'll be a paper on this in a, in a few weeks time. But we actually understand the origin of these events, and um, but the fact that it correlates with the right with the high energy background event, of course, also tells you that it can't be dark matter, right? So this is something that gets generated by background radiation. And then for two electron events, we have a upper limit of you know about five events per gram per day. This again is the lowest rate ever measured in a silicon detector, and it seems to disfavor you know a dark matter interpretation of all the excesses that other experiments have seen including a sensor previously. So I'm not gonna talk more about this. Gordon, I believe is gonna talk about this after me today. So I look forward to hearing the latest status with um, whether there's an explanation for um, all these excesses in terms of a dark matter possibility. And then for three and four, as I said, we had to sh stop early because of the COVID-19 pandemic. There we are exposure limited. We could have taken more data without, we, wouldn't, we didn't expect to see any more three or four electron events just from background. So here we're just exposure limited. So then the dark matter results are the following. So we can consider different models. So dark matter scattering of an electron through some heavy mediator. We go down to um, 500 kV. These different cyan lines or the different analyses, one, two, three, and four electron events. So you see uh, they just have different thresholds, of course. Um, we're just showing them individually here. And then there's a lot of activity in the community um, from other experiments. So you see CDMS high voltage, uh, old sensor on the surface and the prototype sensor in the MINOS. Damic at Snow Lab has some um, excellent results using ordinary CCDs, standard CCDs. Um, there's also, but for this particular model, Xenon one ton dominates at high masses, okay. For the light mediator, then the low threshold from sensor really helps. So in that case, we find that um, we now beat the Xenon 10 limit. Um, barely uh, uh, a little bit that's been standing there for a while for the light mediator but there the limits are very very strong across the whole mass range and we're getting close to this freezing line as well um, we can also imagine that we can const we can also constrain dark matter nuclear interactions through the migdal effect where the dark matter nuclear interaction spits off an electron um, in silicon there's actually a lot of uncertainties in terms of calculating this especially for low masses so this is this bound should only be seen as sort of an estimate an estimated bound, a rough bound. Um, more theory work is needed to really nail this down, but you see that you can, in principle, also constrain dark and nuclear interaction down to very low masses. And then finally, absorption. We see that we have constraints on, uh, in this case, dark photon being absorbed by an electron up to about 12 V, which is where we stopped, sorry, up to about you know, 
um, 1415 EV, which is where we stopped analysis for the 4 uh, after the 4 h analysis here. So the plans for Sensei, just in the last minute, um, we plan to deploy 48 skipper CCDs, so about 92 gram at Snow Lab. Of course, everything is delayed because of the pandemic, but probably, hopefully later this year, early next year, we can install this. One skipper CCD is really operating at Snow Lab. Um, a vessel is being assembled at Fermilab, and I just put some pictures of the design drawing as well as the real picture that's being assembled of the vessel um, at the bottom here. And the, crucially, the shield will be much, much better. So right now we have this 3,000 events per kilogram per day BKV, um, with even with the extra light shielding at Minos. And at Snow Lab, we expect three orders of magnitude better. So there's a bright future for skipper CCDs. So Sensei, 100 gram year exposure. That's what the hope is. Uh, it's funded. Damic M is planning a one kilogram detector running for approximately a year. So this is what the sensitivity are of those detectors. It's, it's a fully funded experiment as well, running in Modan. We'll be running in Modan in France. And then Oscura, which is a 10 kilogram experiment or so. And then I'm showing you a 30 kilogram year, so three years running. Um, what the sensitivity would be. And for that, the R&D is funded for the next few years by the Department of Energy in the US. So to summarize, searches for electron recalls allow access to much smaller dark matter masses than standard WIMP searches. And I just, so this was not an overview talk, but I'll talk about two things. So Xeno one ton, which has reported an intriguing excess. There are several viable models, including downscaling of exothermic dark matter, and as well as absorption of a dark photon or a photophobic ALP dark matter. And then also talk about Sensei, where we have new skipper CCDs and the first results with those. Um, we'll be able to have leading constraints for several models and masses. And the, I think the more important thing is, besides the, the constraints at the moment, uh, is that the results we have sort of show that the 100 gram search at Snow Lab makes sense and, and should work. So, in terms of what the background capabilities are and how the sensors are working. So, thanks very much. <laughs>